พุทธเธอบักวาทุปาระหะทุสมมาสมบุตถสนะโมทัสสะบักวาทุปาระหะทุสมมาสมบุตถสะอภาฤทธาเดชทางอมตะสัทวรายิสุรวันทาบมุญันตุสัตังเราจะไปดูเอื้อราชการเดี๋ยวจะไปดูเอื้อราชการเดี๋ยวจะไปดูเอื้อราชการเดี๋ยวจะไปดูเอื้อ Memorize Pali and you know, it's kind of the same thing, but but it's uh, I think the commitment to the life is such a strong one, that, and you can see that, like here in in England, you don't ordain people all that easily because they go through quite a long period of training. So so the uh, like. Uh, Venerable s a w a k o and k a w e s a k a went to the, at least a year of Anagarika and then two years of Samanera, and so then they still want to take on the higher ordination. <laughs> that shows an kind of credible kind of character that sees the value, and willing to to do that, uh, because it's. Uh, It is what what is generally referred to as renunciation, and the, the renunciation is in a hedonistic society is, I think, probably very inspiring, because you're going against uh, the whole kind of trend uh, of the society you're living in. Renunciation then can be seen, you know, a lot of people see it in terms of. Of a kind of a, a kind of dis- disparaging life, you know, to give it up and seeing it as bad, or or kind of like turning your back on it. So, renunciation can have a kind of uh, unpleasant feeling to it. And of course, the modern life tends to want to affirm. The world is, uh, you know, that you should be happy and and enjoy life, and so there's a lot of affirmation uh, in modern life. We want to to uh, to to just endlessly seek for happiness. So, like modern materialism and the kind of modern fashions, are an endless pursuit of trying to be. Have an interesting or fascinating, exciting or happy life. But then, in, uh, when people incline towards meditation, they usually are getting to get weary of that because uh, you know too much happiness, too much excitement, too much adventure, too many romances, too much fun. It all gets so boring. You know, so it, you know you get tired of of uh, of just seeking for happiness and and interesting uh, and an interesting life. So that's a good sign when somebody when somebody awakens to the fact that that there may be something more important than just uh, the a little distraction or seeking pleasure and happiness from this life that we live. Of course, many of us. Do have has strong feelings, intuit intuitions, more intuition than feelings that there's something more to life than than happiness.
the the renunciation then is is seen not as a as, as a kind of it's not an ascetic renunciation it's not a in order to uh, kind of uh, control ourselves and to because we despise the world it's not done from a negative position but it's done from the interest in simplifying life so like like monastic life is a simplification it's a form or a lifestyle, as they say, that that is that makes life very simple because you you're um, you're living in a in a way that your needs are minimal. Uh, you don't have you don't have a high standard to maintain, and you're living in a in a moral vehicle. So your relationships with with people are based on a kind of morality rather than on uh, just personal feelings and then your your um, intention is to realize the truth awaken to the Dhamma so you couldn't you know when, when it comes to that that's 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 quite a quite a wonderful thing somebody wants to awaken realize the truth be free from suffering and live a simple life uh, I noticed this, I've been a monk now 34 years, 35, and, uh, and it does get, it gets into increasing, increased simplicity. Because, you know, when I first started, and before I even ordained, I was, I was getting incredibly complicated. Uh, I was about 32 when I became a monk, so I, I was, very complicated by 32. That means I was neurotic. <laughs> Complex, complicated, and and um, confused. So that the three C's. <laughs> because life had been a, a, a pursuit, you know, of trying to find, you know, myself and something that I wanted to do with my life. And I couldn't really, really see anything that, that, that compelled me, that, that really I wanted to give myself to in any way, such as a profession or any, any of the options that were available to me. I'd worked in, uh, I'd been in university. I was training to become a lecturer. I want I thought, well, I'll become a lecturer in Chinese history. So I, I did the degrees at universities to get get qualification in uh, Asian cultural studies. And, and uh, but then I, that, I knew that wasn't what I was really interested in doing. But I couldn't think of I couldn't think of anything else. I've never kind of, I never really wanted to be wealthy or had ambitions on that level. But the, um, but then when I came across Buddhist monasticism, then that was, uh, that solved the problem because it offered a, a lifestyle, a way of living your life that seemed integrated. You know, it wasn't just a, a profession you did on a certain time of the day and had weekends off, it is actually, you know, a whole life that you develop. And, uh, and that's what I really, what really interested me, was uh, working on that level, is, is to, to, uh, to not be fragmented. In, I saw in my own family in America, the, you know, the endless conflicts around profession, family, and and uh, the, the problems that my parents had were, you know, their life always seemed bits and pieces and in fragments and not very well integrated in it, into anything. So Buddhist monasticism, of course, is, is as I encountered it in Thailand, was uh, I, I met Nung Kho Cha, and that was 
uh, kind of what I'd hoped for, you know, kind of a monasticism that, uh, that uh, because a lot of what I saw in places like Bangkok didn't impress me as all, at all. I was not, didn't really like the, the temples, the temple life in Bangkok. But when I saw the forest monasteries in Northeast Thailand, that appealed to me, the whole, uh, that kind of form seemed uh, something that inspired and what I'd like to be involved with. But when I ordained, I didn't know, uh, and, uh, and, uh, nobody could speak English where I ordained, so, so I just learned all these poly phrases and I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> they just say, oh, say this, I say it. <laughs> it wasn't anything like this ordination. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what to say next. It's like nonsense syllables, you know. You just, but uh, that seemed to be all they, you know, they, we went through the formalities. Then as later I began to really reflect on what, what I'd actually committed myself to. Arms mendicancy was one thing that shocked me a bit because I didn't realize to what extent that was, you know, like being dependent on alms, not having money. Because the temple I ordained in in Nongka, as soon as I ordained, they gave me money. So I thought, well, you know, you say you don't have money, but obviously everybody gives you money. So I, I, had, I, was, I didn't quite understand what it was all about, but I didn't really think about it too much, but when I met Ajahn Chah, then uh, there's no chance of having any money. <laughs> and when I went to the first the first week I stayed with him, you know, I found out that you're not supposed to have any money at all, any personal funds. And I had money at the time, so I I uh, I gave it to somebody else, you know, on, on the sly. I didn't want anyone to know. But Ajahn Chah had eyes all over the place. And so he said, oh, so you have money, huh? And he <laughs> shouts it out all over the place. <laughs> then my my social background is one where you're trained to be independent. The ideal is to be, not to depend on others. It's kind of disgraceful to, to be in any kind of dependent relationship where you need the support from other people. So, I mean, I was so independent, you know, when I, as soon as I was 16 years old, I started supporting myself. And, and I never, you know, I, I, when I left parents home at 17, I never depended on them. I supported myself and uh, took care of my needs and never asked for, for any help from my parents. So I was just kind of pride of being, you know, I take care of myself and I don't, and I'm, I'm not uh, a needy person that depends on others for anything and then find myself totally dependent. So that was, but then in, in, uh, I wanted to understand it, why the Buddha established a monastic order on alms mendicancy, because it was quite intriguing to think that you got this, this is the oldest probably monastic order that still exists in the, in the world, you know, 2,544 years, uh, managed to survive, and on alms, on alms. So that's a good record, you know. And you think of it, that's, that's quite, seemed, you know, in terms of the way my American mind thought, that seemed quite amazing. Because it shouldn't, shouldn't work. Things, you know, based on such seemingly, uh, uncertain things, uh, uncertainties as alms, depending on alms, shouldn't shouldn't work or shouldn't last. 
But Lung Po Cha was very much uh, pointing out that that the Buddha's intention was uh, establishing around the goodness and generosity of of the human of humanity. And he pointed this out that wherever there, you know, wherever there are good people, then you can survive. It don't, they don't even have to be Buddhists or even religious people, but people who will who have compassion or kindness and are generous. So this this also brings brought me into a way of reflecting on what uh, you know the the kind of beauty behind the, the establishment of an alms mendicant order because like here at Amravati or Chitters, you you've got monasteries established on, solely on alms giving you know free will offerings and that and they they work you know in a modern European country like this one. So, and according to most people, when we first came to UK in 77, most people said you couldn't do it. Predictions were all negative. You know, don't be foolish. People thinking we should take up book binding or having some kind of business that we did. Make liqueurs. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so this, uh, this, this sometimes you know you it, it brings you into a state of of where you're looking at humanity in a different way, like like the negative view is that hum, you know, like the materialist view is that we're vain and selfish and. And and we and we can be bought, you know. We can be easily deluded, and 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 you can get us to do anything if you give us enough money, you know. You can make people do what you want if you pay them off. And so there's this this negative, uh, cynical view of humanity, which is, which oftentimes seems, you know, quite real when you if you depend on your view of humanity is reading the newspapers, the London newspapers. <laughs> But uh, my my view of humanity has been quite different as a as a Buddhist monk because living on alms for 35 years is uh, you know I've, I've experienced the other side the good side. So this needs this I want to to make conscious you know how not not to to. To deny the, the fact that human beings can be selfish and vain and corrupt, and forth, because that's certainly within all our experience, and 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 oftentimes that's the view uh, that's held. But I think also we need to recognize, from a spiritual perspective, the goodness of our humanity. That our humanity is something to respect. And uh, and that and because this good side is 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 more real than the other. If, if given a chance, if given, uh, you know, if respected and given the chance, then people do rise up, and they find a lot of joy in in being in gener in their generosity and their goodness. Speaking about renunciation in the in the final stage, say of total renunciation, because when you're taking it to 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 enlightenment, then you're relinquishing everything. It sounds like a total total wipeout. You're giving uh, you give up your personality, your identity, uh, everything. And then the more you realize that, the more you can give up, the, the happier you are. So happiness is not being anybody. And uh, happiness, in, in this sense of happiness, isn't getting what I want, but not being anybody. So, like in meditation, you, 
you know, when, when you're trying to attain stages and, and get, like in many of us start meditation from the, from the idea of wanting to get enlightened or get stages of, you know, feel we're getting some place. You know, like you go through university, you want to get a BA, MA, PhD, or you want to feel that if you've devoted your life so many years of meditation, you've got some kind of attainment uh, for it. And so that's the that's the conditioning of the mind. It's attainment or, a, or to, to goal to get to get something back for the hard work you put into it. But I find that doesn't work because it's you 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 no, there's nothing to attain. You know, it's, it's not like you you're trying to get something you don't have. What what you're doing with meditation is you're relinquishing all the delusions that you have. So, so it's matter. Of, it's not a matter of getting enlightenment, but of letting go of delusion. So that's where the Buddha emphasized the mindfulness. This this word sati, sampachanya, sati panya. Where it says it's, it's, these words I really like because they they really they're very direct and point to to the ability we all have of. Of be of opening to life and letting go of our delusions through seeing the suffering that we create through holding on to these these delusions. The biggest delusion is, I am this body, and so this body is is me, and I am this this person. And so, the, you know, the whole cultural conditioning is based on that del- delusion, that illusion of being a somebody, being a body, being a person. And, and that, of course, uh, is, is, is the cause of, of our suffering because we're identifying all the time with what, we, what, with something that isn't real. And then the, these, the sense of itself is conditioned into the mind, so it's it's always, you know, you, you're never quite sure who you are uh, until you you know you, unless you have you know you 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 have to find some kind of reinforcement for for your self-importance, such as approval from others or having a position or being considered attractive or popular or interesting or worthy or good or whatever having having the approval having some some outward source of of people affirming your identity and then it can easily go into the opposite of of being looked down on being despised being made fun of being considered useless or or uh, unlovable and whatnot so that that the self is always, you know, it's a pretty shaky thing to be identified with because it can, it can easily swing from one to the other. Just like praise and blame, you, you can, you know, it's nice to be praised. Somebody says, I just made you such a great, wonderful teacher. And it sounds nice. And then somebody else can say, you, you're hopeless. Don't know what you're talking about. You know, and you, so you you can you can feel happy or sad according to the opinions of others. Or the body itself, you know, when you identify with it, it is, it's uh, you know it's a, something that is isn't going to be what you want. Uh, so so there's always something wrong with it in terms of vanity. Uh, you know, it's not, you know, always you, you can see, you know, your nose is too big or small or, or your chin is too, don't have enough big of a, a nice chin or it's too big or it's too small or your mouth is too big or too small. You're, you know, cosmetic surgery is making enormous profits out of people's uh, aversion to their bodies by trying to, to make them better all the time. And then, of course, in spite, even if you've got an absolutely perfect body, it gets old. <laughs> and to sustain it, you know, it's, it's 
so hard to keep it in any fit condition for very long, and then it then it gets pain and sickness and dies. So, so that the identity with the body is uh, is just a you know you're set up for a lot of suffering. So changing, say, the, the relationship from I am my body to this body is is the way it is. It's it's you know you're contemplating it in terms of it, of the experience of it rather than according to some ideal uh, uh, some idea you have of how, how what body should be. So you you're noticing that this what it is to have human to be to have a sensitive form like this to be in this sensitive state continuously from birth to death where you, you're always there's something always happening pinging irritating uh, on this on this body because when you really contemplate your life it's been an endless procession of being irritated you know, one right after another and, and <laughs> you know and you get cold and you get hot and you get Hungry and thirsty, and and it, it goes on and on and and in uh, you know, and just coming from Sri Lanka and Thailand, or, you know, in, in Colombo, and you have mosquitoes, and it's too hot, and you're sweating, and and then then people talk about England is too cold, and I don't like that. Where you get perfect temperature. And then you can you can have air conditioning now, and they have the perfect temperature. But then you get stu- stuffy, and you get Legionnaire's disease and other problems. And, uh, so the, no matter what, how hard you try, it's, it's hard to get anything to sustain itself in a in a completely in a state that uh, that that you can be fully comfortable in and happy and not feel any kind of irritation. So reflecting like this, you you began to to recognize the body is 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 not self. And and this not this isn't through convincing yourself, but it's through noticing, through awakened investigation of of the of the experience of having a physical body. It's not not like we're trying to convince you that your body's not you, but it's it's the this kind of teaching is a full reflection to so contemplate what is it you, you know, or you know, to to look at it in different ways rather than just assume, go from the assumption. So letting go of the body is renunciation. But then I find letting go of the body is is, uh, is is not like trying to get rid of it. It's not asceticism. It's not it's not aversion and it, and uh, to the body or trying to just dismiss it as something nasty. Then it's learning how to live with it. You know, so we have sila and and ways of of living that are respecting the needs and demands of the physical body. Like when the Buddha, before he was the Buddha, did the six years of asceticism. You know, these gruesome pictures of him all looking like a skeleton with his, you know, his, his stomach completely kind of hollowed out and all, you know, see all his ribs. And it's because of trying to, to discipline the body through trying to not let it, not to kind of frustrate all its desires. And that, that's another road to misery. So it's not a denial, not a asceticism, nor is it uh, an indulgence in just trying to have pleasure through the body, but in understanding through awakened awareness and recognition of, and learning from this experience of, of the physical sense, sentience that we're, we experience as a lifetime as a human individual. So it's interesting when I went to, before I went to Sri Lanka, I had this strong insight about not having any past. And 
So then I go to Sri Lanka and then everybody introduces me with these kind of, the whole, you know, these kind of biographies. And they're all over the top, you know, about how, how I was a medical doctor in the Navy. And <laughs> they never get the facts right. And <laughs> or an airplane pilot in Vietnam. <laughs> And then I've, I've done fantastic things, you know, according to these biographies. But, but then they noticing that that uh, when you when I hear this, you know, it all sounds so. That the, you know, if if you don't have any past, then it's like that's kind of meaningless in a way. But yet you recognize the the uh, that people want some something to to see me, you know, to, to define me as being somebody special. But in terms of renunciation, then it's more, there's nobody, and, and not being anybody, not having any path, uh, it seems, it's is, is joyful. It's quite joyful not to, not have to be anybody. But you have to realize that, you know, yourself. You don't believe me, but, but uh, this, is, this is for reflection. Because when, when you are somebody, then, of course, it, you know, it, it works that when, when somebody says you were, you're the, a great teacher, then, then that makes you, that affirms a sense of yourself as being a person of worth. And then somebody says you're, you're no good, then the, that, that's the the opposite. But if there's no self, no person, then I mean, people say whatever they want, you know. <laughs> it's all kind of like empty and meaningless, and and, and not taking it, not not taking it in a personal way. So renunciation is 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 liberation. But renunciation. Also, it can't be done as a willful act. Just you know, you just you know, reject because the, what we like they come about me or one of the the, the the virtues that are developed in the holy life is not it's not a willful act of rejection or denial, but it's it's a growing understanding of liberation through through not being attacked and through being able to relinquish the attachments that that we find that we have. So today is a it's a special day. The two new bhikkhus, Tavako and Kamesako, and then uh, Samanera Yanadasano. So the two. Two from the Czech Republic, one from France. It's a kind of continental ordination today. And this, uh, this is an incredibly international sangha here. Uh, it shows that the awakening to Dhamma isn't, you know, it's not a particular, it's not a cultural thing. You see, it's, it's, uh, cause it's happening everywhere. You know, all over the planet, you get people from all over who who, uh, who see or when they hear the Dhamma suddenly they they connect with it they recognize that they, it speaks to them living here at Amravati uh, or in in an international community is quite a quite a uh, learning process because uh, you're learning to live with, you know, with people who are who are culturally culturally very different from yourself, and that uh, and and that's where the 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 uh, vinaya and the 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 training is around not around cultural perceptions but around a, a tradition that we we assume was established by the Buddha. 
So it's it's not not trying to 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 change people's cultural orientation, but to to use uh, uh, conventions in order to get beyond even our own cultural attachment. Because in order to to be free, one has you have to transcend your own conditioning. You can't be an American or English or anything. You've got to let go of, of even your national identity, the gender of your of your body. These strong views about gender, you know, and, and rights, women's rights, and male chauvinism, and. <laughs> And it goes on, you know, because the, the, the tradition from from a past, from an ancient past, and the, so then the people endlessly quibble over the over the, the you know the rights of women and, and monks and so forth, where these these can be you know rather uh, fraught issues in this day and age to, to make this terribly important or. Is it really to to transcend the the the, the identity? So in in renunciation, the 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 form that we use is a, like Theravada tradition. It's, uh, it's uh, as as we've learned it in uh, especially in Thailand from the Thai forest tradition. So so that is our Precedent in in our model, because that that's what that's what we've uh, that's what we've started from. Then the adjustment to it in in trying to adapt it properly to European society and modern life, but staying within the the the, the limits of that tradition, not not just trying to to go according to modern ideas and trends and fashions, but trying to 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 make it to allow it to to function uh, in within the particular societies that it exists in a way that that uh, uh, allows it to to uh, be supported and be respected and to be abused. But still, the main the main thing is is not trying to get on the conventional level perfect, but to transcend even the even the conventions of Theravada Buddhism. Because the Buddha teaching is is to even transcend Buddhism itself. So I mean, you're you're you know, with mindfulness, then you're you're going to a place where. You know, Buddhism is a convention that, that arises and ceases, like anything else. So taking it to just the pure awareness, the pure, pure intelligence, pure consciousness. And uh, where before the, the, the convention world starts operating, or the self, or the identity. So in order to do that, that's just mindfulness, to be to be in a open and attentive. You know, the minute, the moment you just paying attention, you're awake. Then at this moment, right now, that that's all it is. It's so simple that it's that it's uh, most people never notice because they're looking for something. So it's just an imminent act of of waking up, of, of being present. And, and then from there, once you begin to to recognize or realize that, then you then you've got perspective on the conventional world that we live in, such as the the form that we have, the conditions and the personalities and the, uh, and the, of, the of the community and the society that we live in. So then, renunciation is ultimately simple. So this awakeness is no person; it's not complicated. And then I can get complicated when I start thinking about it. (laughs) 
We like the, the analogy of the fish, you know, in the water. They, I want some water. You say, there's water everywhere. Say, Where is it? You say, it's, it's right, you know, right, it's in you. It's going through you. It's all around you. Say, I don't see any. And that's like, like for us, that's what consciousness is, isn't it? You get, it's everywhere. Where is it? <laughs> Point it out to me. <laughs> and so it's not a matter of, of, of seeing it, but of being it, isn't it? Being caught, being aware, being awake. So in the training now, like Sabako and Kovetako and Yanadasa and all the training is around just the, you know, using convention for awakening. Because they, we live, we, we live in the, with the convention, they operate, they are the way they are, but then our relationship to them now is, isn't identifying with them, but in recognizing that conventions are like this. So we restrain ourselves within the convention in terms of action and speech, for example. We, we live within the, within the restraints of the Vinaya. So that, that, that helps to reflect our own, our, you know, our, our tendencies to, to, uh, when you have something that, you know, you, you, you've asked, you know, everybody asked to be for the training. So then, so then you have limits placed on behavior and speech. From there, then you can see your own, you know, how the, the resistance or the rebelliousness or the, or the, the various ways that we, we react to restriction or restraint. And I found now just the, more the appreciation of having, other than than just trying to make myself live within the restriction of Vinaya as a kind of, you know, must that I have to do. It's instead of it being something that I have to learn how to live and give up the world and live as a good monk within the restraint of Vinaya, it's more like it's, 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 uh, it makes life so easy because you don't really you know, it, it makes it increase so simple and and pleasant and once you begin to appreciate the the beauty of that form of the samana or the bhikkhu bhikkhuni form. And then its relationship to the society, it's always related. The Buddha related the samana to the lay community. So, you know, it... it the complementary relationship where you have the beautiful form in the society or the, the, the you know, mendicants or samana who lit are content and grateful and appreciative and kind and compassionate. So a society that doesn't have these is rather sad, isn't it? Yet, when you just, you know, a society full of computer programmers or, or flashy businessmen or, you know, or movie stars or whatever, I mean, here, American politicians. <laughs> you know, it's not kind of, pop stars, rock stars, and that kind of thing. They're kind of fascinating, interesting people, but, but to have a society full of, of, of people like that, you know, is, you know, it, 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 it would be a, a hell realm if everybody, if there were no arahants or Buddhists or Samanas. That's why, you know, so many people do, uh, get so enthralled when people like the Dalai Lama or, you know, when you, when it's some, some particularly uh, religious person becomes highly regarded internationally, it, you know, it, it means a lot because we, we long to see that, that we, we want, we long to have Dalai Lamas and saints and Mother Teresas and 
and uh, Sufi mystics and selfless beings in the society. And that's why oftentimes people get so angry when when they when they when people take advantage of it. You know the the scandals around the guru and so forth. You get so irate because you know there's the, there's such a big disappointment where you put so much hope in in somebody as being honest, trustworthy, and worthy of respect. But then, people suffer because they want to see it in somebody else and maybe not feel they can do it themselves. Now this is a challenge, isn't it? I remember seeing myself whinging about the fact that, you know, in the United States, 40 years ago, I used to complain, why can't we produce, you know, really outstanding people like Mahatma Gandhi? Why do we always have these uh, mediocrities? Why do we? Why can't we produce really extraordinary people, saints and spiritually evolved beings? And it's going on like that, and then the inner voice says, "Well, why don't you try? Why don't you whinging about you complaining? Why don't you do something about it?" And then the emotional world says, "Oh, I can't do it. No, 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 I'm not." No. <laughs> and I thought, "Yeah, I want somebody else to do it." <laughs> I said, you better shut up because, <laughs> because you, you know, you're going around complaining, but I, am I willing to try? Well, am I willing to do it? And then that gave me some direction, actually, because after that I did I put forth a lot of effort <laughs> trying to not, not be a saint, but, you know, but in terms of really trying to understand life. And to uh, and to be worthy of the alms that I receive, and I read a quote. We heard a quote recently from Blake saying, uh, "Gratitude is heaven itself," <laughs> and uh, I like this very much because. Uh, in monastic life, I think one of the great, one of the heart-opening experiences I had was, was gratitude. That being an alms mendicant, uh, at first, you know, I, I kind of understood it uh, theoretically, but I didn't, I didn't uh, really appreciate it on the heart level. You know, it was, I took it for granted. Then, about the sixth year of my monastic life, I had this gratitude experience. Where I suddenly I felt this incredible gratitude to the Buddha and Lung Pan Cha and the Thai people and everybody that's been kind of, you know, supporting, helping, encouraging, feeding, clothing me for for those years. And, and so I found that gratitude then was like a, like it opened something up. The, I would say the heart opening experience because then uh, my a kind of devotional side started developing where before it was mainly just head you know kind of ideas of getting attaining and very psychological very kind of western uh, intellectual uh, attitudes that, that, that motivated me and and it wasn't till the katanyu or the gratitude that I started feeling it on a on a heart level, a real love and uh, and appreciation. And, and it, like Blake says, gratitude is heaven itself. Because then the the holy life became, you know, it was it, instead of you know just trying to make myself. Uh, practice and, and try to attain the samadhi and trying to control my desires and all that, then I began to feel that that whole 
kind of sense of self-importance and, and, and that dropped the sense it just started fading out. And there was more a trusting joyfulness in the life. So, offer this as a reflection, an encouragement to everybody. Uh, as, uh, on the ninth, we uh, we start our winter's retreat. It's named that Chittern. This uh, to to uh, end of March. This this is well supported by the lay community that they. The monks and nuns here can uh, devote themselves to the more formal uh, practices. And it, uh, we really appreciate this, you know, and tremendous gratitude to the lay community for coming forth and making this possible. So, uh, because it is, this is a chance to, you know, to really contemplate your own experience. And in, in, uh, we need to see that, that, uh, the, the flow of life, the ordinary life, uh, and also the, uh, you know, the, some people think meditation is just formal practice. You know, you can't meditate unless you have the conditions, very good conditions for it. And, that's one extreme, and then others think you shouldn't, you know, you don't need uh, formal conditions, just be mindful in daily life. That's another extreme. <laughs> and both, you know, they, they both have their points to make. But, but uh, one of the advantages of the summoner life is that you, you do have periods like this where, where it's possible to, to kind of remain very silent still and, and, uh, to see what happens, and to to be willing to accept what happens, no matter what it is. So. Okay.